Hello, this is Roman Jinji Hashvili, and welcome back to uh, our series about new opening revelations with uh, detailed and uh, impeccable analysis using latest version of Ripka. Our today's topic now is one of the biggest openings for uh, in modern chess theory a Grunfeld defense. And we're gonna uh, cover Grunfeld for black, and we're gonna recommend Grunfeld for black. <coughs> and I wanna tell you, uh, based on latest analysis and games of the top players, we came to conclusion that it's as good an opening for black against d4 as any, and we strongly recommend to uh, play Grunfeld. However, there is one downside, why, and that's the downside uh, that I had in mind when I never made any DVD uh, on how to play Grunfeld for black. I've played lots of games, mostly with white, uh, <coughs> against Grunfeld. The downside is that when you play Grunfeld, unlike any other opening, white has all the choices of variations. So we're gonna go d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, D5, and the white has now a whole bunch of variations. They can play CD followed by E4, which is main variation, and they can go knight F3, G3, and even if they go CD after knight takes D5, <coughs> there is a whole bunch of different continuations for white, and Black has to be prepared. So, in other words, black has to learn a lot. So, we, on our end, try uh, to be, try to give you material, black, as abbreviated as it is possible, using novelties, mentioning novelties, and also not to talk too much about different choices black may have because we always suggest the best uh, uh, choice. So, however, we have to be prepared for any and every continuation white might choose. And it's a lot of times we're gonna tell you, show you the novelties that we use or use ideas of some other top players so you're going to have very interesting and very lively material that you will enjoy. And with me I have here uh, Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. And um, Eugene did enormous work. And he works uh, with me together. And he works with Ripka too. And together we teamed up, as you know, not too long ago. Uh, actually, he was my student for many, many years, but we teamed up uh, for this project. And here is Eugene, which who will give you very detailed and very, very good uh, review of the main variations and some other variations you will see on our second part of Grunfeld defense today's version. So now sit tightly and get ready. Here is Eugene Perlstein. Hi everyone, Eugene is here. And in the first part, we're gonna look at the main line where white takes, C takes D, knight D5 and E4. And after e4, we take on c3. 
on Tx. And this position is something that I want to talk about a little bit before we go into details and start talking variations. So the fundamental idea of the Grunfeld is that black leaves the center. So you see white occupies the center with the point E4 and D4. But now black gets to attack the center with ideas such as C5, later on even E5. And the key here is the dark square bishop is going to support the attack. And notice that the pawn stru structure is very fluid. Black has no weaknesses. Whereas white does have a significant weakness, which is the pawn on c3 and the weak pawn on a2. So this is very characteristic of the setup where black will try to play against these weaknesses. So here white has two most popular ways to develop. One is bishop c4 followed by knight e2 and this is what we're going to look at first and the second is slightly different plan knight goes to f3 and then bishop usually goes to either e2 the rook sometimes goes to b1 and this is slightly different plan so first let us look at the move bishop to c4 So actually, after bishop g7, bishop to c4. And here, as I mentioned earlier, black immediately strikes the center with c5. White plays knight e2. Knight c6, keep attacking the center. And white plays bishop to e3. And here... Black simply castles. So we're going to finish our development. And white usually castles as well. And this position has been discussed for many years. There are many plans from black and from white. But the plan that Roman and I like the most, and as well as we checked with our good friend, the strongest chess engine in the world, Ripka, is playing on the queen side. Because as I mentioned earlier, white has most weaknesses on the queen side with the pawn c3 and a2, and this is where black will attack. So we start with the move knight to a5, hitting the bishop, bishop d3, and now a simple move b6. So this is the topical position for the b6 variation. Now first I should mention that taking the pawn on c5 is something which is not recommended for white because this is exactly the type of position black is looking for. After b takes c, bishop takes c5, Queen c7, black gets immediate counterplay for the pawn. And you're going to see shortly that white's extra pawn doesn't really play much of a role in these types of positions. Because the c3 pawn is really weak and white doesn't have much of an option really to do anything about it. So if d takes c, B takes a bishop c5, queen c7. White can try to play bishop a3. By the way, bishop d4 is actually helping black to secure the e5. So after e5, bishop has to retreat. And we simply play bishop e6 or rook d8 first, followed by bishop e6. And this is a very comfortable position for both. So let's just say white tries to play 
bishop a3, and hang on to his extra pawn. So after rook d8, pinning the bishop, white plays, let's say, queen c2. And here, after the normal e5, by the way, we're not really afraid to close down the bishop on g7, because as you're going to see shortly, the typical plan in these positions is actually trading dark square bishops. And really, in this position, it's very hard for white to come up with a plan. The knight on e2 cannot really do much, cannot go to either f4 or d4. From g3, the knight doesn't do any damage as well. The problem is a light square bishop on d3. It's kind of stuck. And if white will play c4, we always have immediate attack on the pawn. And you're going, to you're going to see shortly that in all of the different lines where white tries to win a pawn, this is almost always fine for black. So what other options are there? Well, white has, tr has tried several plans in this position. Number one is to try to play against black's king with queen d2 and potentially the bishop h6, or try to hold the center by connecting the rooks. And another two moves that have been played at a high level are simply rook b1 and rook c1 with basic idea to get the rook on a better square and again try to hold the center. So. First, let us look at the move rook b1, and then we're going to look at the move rook c1 and go to the main line, queen to d2. So after rook b1, black now plays very simple. C takes d, pawn takes. And now notice how from the weak pawn on c3, white has now a weak pawn on d4. And now black is going to slowly build up his position and attack that pawn. But for now, we play e6. This is a very useful prophylactic move just in case that white doesn't have d5 in the future. Queen d2, bishop b7. And this position actually occurred at a very recent Grandmaster game, Belyavsky against Topolov. And really there is no advantage for white because black's bishops are perfectly placed. Look at all the white central pawns. And white's only hope is to try to attack the king. Belyavsky tried this with bishop h6, and after takes, queen takes, Topolov could have simply played queen e7, which we think is a much easier way to play this position, followed by rook f to d8, rook a to c8, potentially offering the queen trade, and black has nothing to worry about. So again, rook b1, we simply take on d4, and play e6, followed by central development and attacking white's pawn. Now let us look in this position at another more common move, rook to c1. Again, white is simply trying to put defensive kind of setup in the center and they are waiting the c takes d where rook is actually doing much better on the c file as, as opposed to the b file. So in this position, black doesn't take on d4 and there is no need to because we have a much better option. So 
So we have a very strong move of attacking white center with the move e5. So again, notice how black can alternate his plans. He can either take on d4 and play e6 as in the rook b1 variation, or he can attack the center with the move e5. And now white takes the pawn. So finally white is committed to taking the pawn on c5. By the way, if white plays d5, this gives black a lot of different options. Number one, we can immediately start the kingside expansion with f5, potentially f4, g5, and very similar plays in the king's Indian. Or we can hold off f5 and play c4, so bishop has to go, and then knight b7, potentially knight d6. This is a very good blockading piece, and then f5. So this is very, very good for black. So let's take a look at the d takes c. And as I mentioned earlier, black is totally okay with giving up the pawn. And now, as though nothing has happened, he simply plays bishop to e6. So now we will take a look why taking the pawn is totally fine for black. And here the main line is c4. So notice that white doesn't want to take the pawn on b6. Rather he wants to activate perhaps his knight to c3 and d5. Or he is waiting for black to take and he is going to take with the bishop hitting rook on f8. But before we look at c4 move, let's quickly take a look at what happens after c takes b, a takes b, and now c4. So this position actually happened at a grandmaster game and black I think white was played by Van Wely and black by Elianov, very strong grandmasters. And Elianov played a very simple plan. And I think this is a very instructive plan for these types of positions. He goes queen to b8 with the main idea to play rook to c8, put pressure on the c4 pawn, and to prepare this very powerful maneuver, bishop f8, bishop c5, to trade the dark square bishops. So let, let us take a look at this game, see what happened after rook c3. So Eliana falls up with rook to c8. Van Bele plays queen c2. Notice how even though white is an extra pawn up, the bishop on d3 is completely dead, the knight on e2 has no future, and all black has to do is trade his dark square bishop. So after bishop f8, rook b1, bishop c5, it is clear that black has no problems and does actually pretty good. So in the game, Van Vele tried to activate his knight, after bishop takes, rook takes, knight c1, with the idea knight b3, but it turns out it's not going anywhere after queen c7. The pawn is really a target now. Knight b3, simply dropping back to c6. Van Vele found nothing better than to simply drop back to d2 and offer a draw, because black is going to Black would either wait, rook c5, to prove that white has no uh, plan, or, you know, put even more pressure by tripling up on the c5. So this is very important that the exchange of the dark square bishops is a key plan in black's setup. So now let's go back. And... White doesn't take the pawn.
Instead, white plays c4. Black takes, bishop takes c5. And now we don't play the normal looking rook e8, which gives white time to regroup. Instead, black has a very strong move, bishop to h6. As a matter of fact, this was played by very renowned Grunfeld expert Sotovsky against, I believe, Hare Krishna. And white played a very aggressive move, f4. So we're going to look at this shortly. But let us take a look at the move bishop takes f8. And this is, again, illustration where white is a pawn up. But black is able to trade the dark square bishops. So bishop takes, queen takes. King takes f8 is actually a very strong novelty. Uh, the previous games, black played queen takes f8. But we believe king takes f8 is much stronger because you need the queen on c7. And the king could always go to g7 if needed. And this position is actually roughly even. But for example, knight f3, bishop takes c4 is immediate draw. Because if knight takes knight, bishop takes d3, knight c6, queen c7, queen takes bishop. Queen takes knight, this is dead even position. And if white doesn't play knight d3 and tries to hold on to the extra pawn, so this is the position. If white doesn't play knight d3 and tries to hold on to the extra pawn with the move queen a4, then after simple rook c8, Black is doing wonderful. As a matter of fact, after rook d1, king g7, bishop e2, hitting the queen, queen b6, black could only be slightly better, even though he is a pawn down, but this is a target. The pawn is going to fall shortly. And since black has a much better pieces and piece coordination, he can only stand better in this game. So back to the bishop h6 position. Here, Hare Krishna played a very aggressive move, f4. So let's try to understand why it's idea. Well, he wants to play f5, potentially. And at the same time, blocks the bishop so the rook is hanging on the fade. So black has to play accurately, and black simply plays rook to e8, f5. So again, this is his main idea, bishop takes e1, the exchange sacrifice, and now pawn takes e6, threatening e takes f, winning, and the bishop on c1 is hanging. So very strong idea for white. But Black, of course, doesn't have to take the bishop. And as Sotovsky correctly played queen c7, hitting the bishop is the right move. Now, the best square is bishop f2, because bishop b6 could run into some problems. Queen b6 and hitting the bishop on b4. So that's why bishop f2. And now again, black could have tried to take the exchange and prove that white doesn't have sufficient compensation, but there is no need to because he has a much stronger move and Sotovsky actually played this move, bishop takes c4. So getting the pawn back and also the rook is still hanging on c1. So bishop takes 
c4, knight takes c4. And now Hare Krishna played ambitious looking knight c3, still trying to sacrifice the exchange. Now we're gonna shortly look at why knight c3 is not good. Uh, just to mention that if rook c3, black has nothing to worry about after rook a to c8. Because the control over the c1 square guarantees that white's f1 rook will never get there. And even though we have a temporary pin, this is not a, nothing to worry about for black. Because white can't really tug the knight more than twice with the rook or if he adds another attack, black is still not afraid of anything because the c1 square is firmly covered by the bishop. So that's why Hare Krishna tried to get aggressive. And he plays knight to c3, clearly indicating that So actually after bishops are changed. So clearly indicating his plan, the knight is going to d5. But here Sotovsky played what I think is an accurate move, knight b2, and got into some trouble. Whereas taking the exchange immediately proves that white has nothing. For example, knight d5, simply queen d8, we take c1, hitting the knight, knight d6, and now it seems that white is going to get very dangerous attack after the move queen h6. But in fact, as proven and analyzed with Ripka, this fails and white is actually losing. For example, knight takes e4, f6, threatening mate. So knight takes f6, and this move, bishop h4, may seem as though finishes the game on the spot. But as always, tactics save the game. If the king was on h1, by the way, then it is correct that white is winning. But the problem is we have this little trick, queen c5 check followed by queen f8, and it is black. Who is winning. So you see in the rook c1 variation, black plays e5 and gets a great game. So now we have covered the rook b1 line that after cd, cd, black gets a good game, and we covered rook c1 variation. E5 is a strong move. So let us focus on the most popular choice, queen d2. Keeping the option of connecting the rooks and potentially playing rook d1 perhaps. Or the main idea is bishop h6. All right, so here we are playing exactly in the same way as in the rook c1 variation e5 hitting the center and forcing white to make a decision. Does he leave the pawn on d4? Does he close the center with the move d5? Or he takes and tries to keep the extra pawn d takes c. So for now let's focus on d takes c and you're going to see shortly that the plan is extremely simple for black. We just simply play bishop e6, rook f d1. So now white is keeping the rook on a1, queen c7. Notice that we're not afraid of pawn takes, pawn takes, because this is going to help black opening up the a file and the c file. And this position has been played at the top level by two strong grandmasters. One is a Chinese grandmaster, Nihua, and black 
very strong Czech Grandmaster, David Navarra, and White here played bishop h6, trading the dark square bishops. As we talked earlier, this is something that black welcomes. And he played, Navarra played rook to d8. Bishop takes g7, king takes g7. And here, after the move queen e3, something happened where black won the game practically on the spot. With this little move, bishop takes pawn. It seems that this is simply a blunder. But after rook a2, it turns out that white is losing after the move knight c4. So notice that bishop takes c4, loses to rook takes d1, made. And if queen moves somewhere, then rook takes a2 is coming next. So basically that means that bishop cannot be touched on a2. And so black got the pawn back with dividends. He has a much better position. And shortly after bishop a2, bishop c2, black just dropped back with the bishop. Black actually converted and won the game. So this is the d take c variation. So again, don't be afraid to play a pawn down because black gets sufficient compensation. And that leaves us with the top line or the top attacking choice. is bishop to h6. And bishop h6, we have one very critical game for this variation, Chiparinov against Gara Kamsky. As you know, Chiparinov is a very young and very strong Bulgarian player who is topple of second. So he is well versed in openings. And Kamsky is playing Grunfeld uh, very, very strongly. Probably he's getting help from his second, Sutovsky, who is a renowned expert in the opening. So I think this is a very topical variation after bishop h6. So e takes d, bishop takes g7, king takes g7, c takes d, and c takes so if you notice, white is given up a pawn. Now, what does white have in return? Well, Chiprinov's idea is to get the attack going with the move f4. He is trying to play against the weak king on g7. And Kamsky actually proves that white's attack is nothing to be worried about with the move f6. So this is... Uh, game that was played recently and we can say that black actually is doing quite well and let us take a look what happened. Rook c1, bishop to g4, knight g3, here Kamsky drops back to g7 because he's afraid of this move f5. So bishop g7, h4, and now after the move rook c8, black is going to trade at least a pair of rooks. And it's still hard for white to show the real value in his attack. Analyzing this game further, you will show that Kamsky was completely winning actually throughout the whole game. And then it turned out that he simply blundered in time pressure move 38 and actually lost, but he was totally winning with big advantage throughout the whole game. And uh, I recommend you to actually go over in the, go over that game and analyze it in detail 
to see how powerful Black's position is. So this concludes the bishop c4, knight e2 line. There is some theory that you have to know. Of course, this is the main line, right? So you have to know the theory, but also pay attention to all of the different pawn structures and different plans, especially after b6, where black sacrifices the pawn. That black has a very easy and it's actually a very instructive play on the dark squares, on the C file, against the weak C4 pawn. And also pay attention to the lines where black plays E5, undermining the center. This was up-to-date coverage of bishop C4 variation followed by knight E2 with all the reasonable updates and notice there is a lot more material so black can play differently including b6 variation and some other place or c5 followed by exchanging later and queen a5 check we are not covering those we are not covering because we are not recommending to play this for black so we are covering only all the options for white and so what should we do about them. <coughs> so we covered bishop c4 followed by knight e2, but white has also knight f3, one of the main moves in Grunfeld, followed by either bishop a3, rook b1, bishop e2, or bishop c4, all kinds of different continuations and we have to be prepared for them and this is actually very active positional uh, uh, games and whatever we analyze by now is well supported by super deep analysis with Ripka and whatever we're gonna do from now on just as well so sit tight and here is Eugene Perlstein again. So now we're going to look at another big chapter of theory after the move knight f3. So here, once again, as in the bishop c4 line, we attack the center with c5. And now the most common move I should say, is rook to b1. But before we look at this move, let's take a look at other continuations for white. We're going to look at the bishop b5 check, and this is the move that Kramnik used to beat Kasparov in his famous 2000 match. And another move is bishop e3, Again, another way to try to defend the central point. So, let's take a look at bishop b5 check first. And here we play <coughs> knight to c6. Notice that black is not afraid of the move d5 because of a very strong move queen a5. Of course, we can take on c3, but after bishop d2, the position is a little bit unclear. But rather, queen d5 first immediately solves all of, his, all of the black's problem. And if rook b1, now bishop takes c3, and a bishop d2. We have this very beautiful move a6, and it turns out that in all of the variations, black is doing well. If white takes the knight, pawn takes, and now let's say white tries to win the pawn after d takes c, 
black simply plays bishop e6. And the pawn on c6 is actually quite weak. And if rook c1, the last move that you have to know is this very neat looking bishop to b4. Notice that we don't want to take on d2 as it helps white. He can take with the knight or with the queen. But instead, we play bishop to b4 and saying that white should take on b4 if he wants to. And if white castles, black castles, this is a fine position. Of course, taking on b4, we take with the pawn. The pawn on c6 is weak. Pawn on a2 is going to fall. And black is at least equal, if not better. So we're not afraid of the move d5 because of queen a5. And that leaves white with simply trying to castle and finish development. This is the main line. And of course, black does the same thing. Castle, sure. Notice that black is never afraid of this temporary pawn weakness because the pawn on c5 is going to be exchanged for the pawn on d4 and potentially the other pawn will take its place. So this is really good for black and he is never afraid of this exchange. So what does white do? Well, white plays bishop e3 and he hopes to have a strong defense of the d4 square after black takes and takes on d4. But this is not the move that we recommend. And as a matter of fact, we think immediate bishop g4 is much stronger. Because of course, taking the pawn on c5 is going to have these crippled pawns and they're going to fall like a, card, like a stack of cards. So after bishop g4, white has to play d5 if he wants to try to fight for advantage. And now the following line could happen. It's all forced, knight e5. Bishop has to draw back to e2. Knight takes f3. Bishop takes f3. So we trade everything. And we have reached this position. So the position is roughly even. And black is not afraid to take the pawn on c5. So it's a temporary pawn sacrifice by white. And after rook b1, it's better to return the b7 pawn and we play queen to d6. And after the move bishop h6, for example, Bishop g7 and the mutual trade. This position is about even, probably even drawish. And if rook takes b7, we trade the pair of rooks and black stands well. And this is from a game by Gausso against Jan Mag Magnus Carlsen, where black showed that after bishop g4, followed by Knight e5 after d5 black stands well. So we have looked at the bishop d5 check, and again after knight c6 black is doing well. And before we will take a look at the main move rook b1, <coughs> let's take a look at another popular choice by white bishop to e3. So white is not committing his f1 bishop yet, but for now he plays a very useful move with the bishop defending the d4 pawn. And here black actually uses this temporary lapse in white's slow development to attack the weakness on c3 with the move queen to a5. 
So white defense, queen d2, castle, rook to c1. This is very, uh, you can say, prophylactic move because it anticipates the trade and go into this end game where the rook on c1 is actually doing quite well. But the thing is, black doesn't have to take on d4. As a matter of fact, he's not even afraid of d takes c because these are, again, very weak pawns. c5, c3, a2, and especially the c5 pawn is going to fall quickly, and there is no need for white to take on c5 in the near future. But for now, black plays rook to d8, putting more pressure on the center, and white plays d5. So you could see white's idea, potentially to play c4, trade queens, and just get a very big space advantage. So that's why the whole plan of the opening comes into place. We undermine the center. And the move e6 is very strong. So now white plays bishop to e2. Now, if white plays c4, then we're not really afraid of this endgame because we can trade, and if knight takes, we can play b6. And to give you an illustration of the ideas that you can actually see in this endgame, let's take a look at the move, this bishop e2. And now black plays knight a6. Notice where the knight is hidden. Knight is hidden to the b4 square, and there is nothing white can do to stop it. Because moves such as a3 run into a problem after bishop b2. So after knight a6, castles, black has very strong move, knight b4, a3, and now knight a2, x clamp. This is a very strong idea. The knight is coming to c3. Notice the very funny root, a6, b4, a2, c3. Rook c2, knight c3. And here, there is no easy way for white to get rid of that powerful knight. And the bishop d3, bishop a6. Notice we're going to put pressure from all over, from threatening e takes d, e takes d, knight takes d5. And if white plays bishop g5, then simple move rook d7. And we actually think black stands better. The knight on c3 is doing lots and lots of damage. So c4 is nothing to be afraid of because of the idea b6, knight a6, knight b4, followed by knight a2, knight c3, as we just saw, and y just simply plays bishop to e2. So this is the main line, e takes d, e takes d, and now, again, white is only a few moves from getting a good game, let's say black plays something like bishop to g4. Then after c4, white can get a good endgame and have good ideas for advantage here. But again, let us take a look at this position in more detail. And if we know that white wants to play c4, is there a way that we can prevent him from playing c4 and at the same time put pressure on the d5 pawn? And there is an answer, yes. As a matter of fact, black has to his disposal a very strong novelty, the move b7 to b5. This is an extremely powerful move. And white really has nothing better than to castle. Because taking the pawn on c5 is really going to cause some problems. After the move, bishop to b7, 
the pawn is going to fall, and it's not so easy for white to play this position. Black has tremendous compensation. And if white castles with idea to play c4, so for example, bishop d7, c4, then the position is actually simplified quite easily after the move queen takes queen, knight takes queen, and now we play d takes c. This is the key why the pawn is on d5, and after knight takes c4, bishop takes d5, this is just simply a dead draw, everything is exchanged, and the position is even. So this concludes bishop e3 line. So here we have covered both bishop g5, sorry, bishop b5 and bishop e3 moves. That leaves us with the main move, rook to b1. The main idea of rook b1 is that white is inviting black to go for this double-edged position after queen a5, bishop d2, queen takes a2. So white is sacrificing the pawn. In return, he gets quick development and activity. And we don't want to go into the details of this variation because, first of all, black has much better way to play. And second of all, there is tons and tons of theory that you have to know. If you make one inaccuracy, you're going to lose. And the move that we recommend is actually quite simple development move castle. And after bishop e2, again, we don't want to go for that variation. Instead, we play very similar to the bishop c4, knight e2 line, this move b6. So black is not going for anything crazy. We're playing very solid positional chess. Um, we're preparing potentially fan shadow the bishop or even bishop a6. Sometimes we play queen c7, rook d8, put pressure on the center. And notice that the game is usually very positional and very easy to play for black. So after castles for white, we play bishop b7, hitting the pawn. And here white has two ways to play. The main line is, of course, queen d3. And we're going to look at this. But... The more popular move that has recently been popularized by very convincing victory of uh, by Grandmaster Anishuk against uh, another Grunfeld player, Ilyanov from Ukraine, with the move d5. And the idea is a pawn sacrifice. As a matter of fact, of fact Nakamura played it first at the Olympiad. And Nakamura is playing for the U.S. team. And then Anishuk followed up. So it's clear that uh, top, top grandmasters are trying to steer into this pawn sacrifice line. And the idea is that after bishop takes c3, bishop c4 with idea e5, white gets a pretty good compensation for the pawn. But we have made some exceptional analysis with our you know, good friend and assistant Ripka, and we will show you that black has nothing to worry about in this line. But for now, let's focus on the main move, queen d3, where white doesn't sacrifice the pawn. Well, in this case, that black's plan is actually quite easy. We just simply play e6. This is a very useful move, prepare queen e7 potentially, and the bishop g5. Then we go queen c7. So there is no easy way for white to do anything because e6 prevents white from playing d5 and trying to build up c4. So now white has to try to find other ways to play this bishop. For example, queen e3 with idea to open up the bishop and potentially prepare.
pair bishop h6. And black simply concludes his development with the move knight d7. And he stands well. He's not afraid of d5 or e5. And, you know, black is ready to open up the c file whenever he feels like it after the move c takes d. And if he has a rook on c8, he can actually take control of the c file. And another thing we should mention is that in these types of structures, usually end game favors black. Because whenever you have pawns a2, c3, and potentially c file could get opened up, white has to be careful about the ensuring end games. So that's why e5 is a more aggressive approach with the idea to perhaps play bishop d7, bishop d6. Black prevents that with the move of a to e8. And now white plays bishop b5, trying to pin the knight. But black simply plays bishop c6 and stands well. As a matter of fact, the recent game, white took on c6, black take at the grandmaster level, finished in the draw, because white couldn't really find a way to play for advantage here. But as a matter of fact, there is no easy way to play against black's king. Whereas the light squares and the weaknesses on the queen side are something real. And white has to worry about that always, all the time. And if white doesn't take on c6 and make some prophylactic move, for example, a4, something like that. Black has many options. Black can actually try to play f6 and open up the king side or he can wait and play a waiting move such as queen to b7. So this is something that black can do. After e5, we don't need to, we don't have to prevent bishop e7, and as we will see shortly after bishop to d5, bishop e7, we play rook f to c8, and after bishop d6, queen b7, black gets a good game. As a matter of fact, this position occurred in the game Gelfand Ivanchuk, two very strong players. And Gelfand played a4. So White's idea is try to play a5 and put pressure on the b6 pawn. So Ivanchuk made one correct move of the plan and then he faltered. He took on d4, and now he made the mistake, this very passive move knight b8, which actually runs into problems after a5, and then after exchanging on b6, bishop c5, and the pawn on b6 is actually really weak. So knight b8 is a mistake. Instead, Iwanchuk should have played straightforward move bishop to c4. The idea is to trade light square bishops and have the outpost for the queen on d5 and black gets a really good game. So bishop on d6 is not such a big deal and again control of the light squares and play on the on the queen side is black's plan. So this concludes the Queen d3 line. So we have covered move queen to d3 and showed you how to counter this without any problems for black. Now let's focus on the more popular, especially nowadays, pawn sacrifice d5. So this idea is extremely 
extremely new. As I mentioned earlier, it was played by American players Nakamura and Anishuk at the recent Olympiad. And we have some really important analysis after bishop takes c3. Notice the main idea of the move d5 is to play c4 and really get a grip of the center. Bishop on b7 is going to be out of game and lack of space is going to play a role. But after bishop takes pawn, black already has material advantage and white has to play very, very carefully in order not to, you know, let the game slip. So bishop c4, again, idea is to play e5 where white will dominate in the center. Here black simply traps back to g7 and white has to play something like queen e2, a build up move to prevent, sorry, to prepare rook d1 and then e5. Now a good question to ask is why doesn't white play e5 right away? Because it looks as though these two powerful pawns are really a problem for black because black has to do something now. And the answer is black has this very beautiful move e6. And now white plays queen to e2. Notice that immediate e5 is not something that black is afraid of because black can play knight a6 and then put pressure on the d5 pawn, which is now really weak with the moves knight b4 or even in some instances knight c7. So that's why instead of e5, queen e2 is more like a prevention move. And at the same time, white is getting ready to play rook d1 followed by e5. So after queen e2, we play knight to d7. And white plays a developing move, bishop to f4. By the way, e5 is now, which seems like a good move, is actually met by a very powerful move, e6, x clan. And now if pawn takes e6, black has this intermediate move, bishop takes f3. And pawn takes f7, check, simply king h8. And after queen takes f3, we have this powerful knight takes pawn. Knight is gonna, queen has to go, knight is gonna take the bishop on c4. And then the pawn on f7 is gonna be lost and white is actually losing. So this is an important resource to keep in mind. So why it doesn't have this e5 move? Because again, e5, in this position, e5 is met by e6. So bishop f4, so far so good. We're still following the main game. And now knight f6. So here, Anishuk plays rook f to d1. And notice that black is not afraid of e5. He plays queen d7 because e5, he can take the pawn. And also the idea of queen d7 is potentially we can activate the queen with a4 or g4 and to connect the rooks and potentially the queen could go to e8. That's why white immediately plays knight e5, hitting the queen, activating his knight, queen c8, and here Anishuk plays a prophylactic move h3. So if black is to play knight h5, he always has this 
retreat for the mission. So far, we've been following the line from the game Anishuk Elianov. And here, Elianov makes a very good choice. He plays knight e8 with the idea to play knight d6 and simply organize his pieces. And again, don't forget white, although he has a little bit of initiative, he is down a pawn. So white has to prove something uh, in this position. Otherwise, black is going to convert his extra pawn. So that's why Anishu plays knight c6. This is an aggressive idea. And if bishop takes, pawn takes. So of course, queen takes c6 is met by bishop d5. So here, we actually found a very strong idea for black, an improvement over Ilyanov's game. And the move is e6. I believe in the game, Alianov played bishop d4, which is playable, but e6 is much, much better. Immediately, we want to take the pawn, and there is no easy way for white to do anything about it. So the best white can try is to go for this idea, queen c2. And you're going to see shortly why queen is going to the queen side. Queen takes c6, so now we got another pawn. Bishop d5, hitting the queen, queen c8, and now white plays queen a4. So basically white wants to play bishop c6 and win an exchange. And this is something that black is not afraid of because he is two pawns up and he can simply play knight f6. And he is not afraid of bishop c6 because he's going to have plenty of pawns for the exchange. The other move, which we think is even better because you prevent the rook from controlling the d file, is this move bishop to d4. This bishop on d4 is really a nuisance for white, it controls the whole board. It stands on a very good square, defended by the pawn on c5. And again, if white plays bishop c6, this is exactly what black wants. After knight f6, black is ready to sacrifice the exchange. Because having the two pawns, we're not afraid to sack the exchange. And if white plays bishop to d6, then this is a pretty funny move. We play rook e8. So now we give white an option. Do you want to take this rook or do you want to take that rook? Because either way, black is on top. So this really interesting idea to play e6 and to win the c6 pawn and then sacrifice the exchange has been thoroughly checked on Ripka. And we actually think black is better in all variations and white has to play carefully in order to uh, not lose the game. So this concludes the main line with the d5 and knight of three main line with d5 pawn sacrifice on c3. And also this concludes the main lines where white takes on d5 and plays e4. Many years ago, um in beginning of 50s, very popular was a uh, Russian variation of Grunfeld. Russian because Botvinnik was playing with Smyslov and some other top Russian players, uh, Soviet players at that time. They were playing a queen b3 in this position or after knight f3, bishop g7, queen b3. This was very popular and it was played many, many different ways. I remember I played it a couple of times and I had good results for white, <coughs> but it was always razor sharp and um, very interesting variation. But recently, black found a very good antidote against it and uh, 
this variation doesn't promise any advantage uh, to um, white. There was, I remember, one of uh, my most favorite games ever in the history of chess played with this variation, Beliavsky against uh, Kasparov. And I will analyze this game um, in, a, in a game part, but I will be analyzing some games in the end of the DVD. I have to point that the Belevsky Kasparov game was played a little differently than we want to play. <coughs> but it will clearly show you the type of counterplays uh, Black uh, can get. And actually, I put afterwards this game on a Ripka, and it showed the most precise, the absolute perfect play by Black. Although that's not the variation we're going to choose later. So, after knight f3, bishop g7, queen b3, there is Botvinnik variation, and here is Eugene Perlstein with very good uh, uh, preview on it, and uh, that includes latest games in the top tournaments, plus, as I said, flawless analysis by Ripka. The final evaluation, Black is just fine. So after queen b3, this idea is actually forcing black to take on c4 to do something about a d5 pawn. And as you notice, the difference is earlier when white's queen is on d1 and white took on d5, there are lines where black took on c3 and pawn takes on c3. So now notice the pawn structure is actually going to be completely different. So after queen b3, black takes on c4, queen takes c4, and white doesn't have the weakness on c3. Uh, the knights are no longer exchanged. And so this is a more complicated way or this is a more complicated middle game because we have more pieces. So the drawback of the uh, Russian variation or the Botvinnik variation is that queen on c4 is ahead of the other pieces. And as we know in openings, it's very important to get ahead in development. So after queen takes c4, black immediately castles. White plays e4, so white is getting control of the center. And now we play move knight c6. Besides knight c6, black has many other ways to play this, uh, this variation. There is knight f to d7, there is a6, there is c6, there is even knight a6. And I believe this is the move uh, Kasparov used to beat Bilyavsky in a very beautiful game, as Roman mentioned. But the most obvious and clear plan is knight c6. And as the Grandmaster games show, there is no advantage for white after this plan. So white plays, for example, bishop e2. Bishop g4. And now the key move is d5. So white is gaining control of the center and attacking the knight. Now let me talk a little bit about the move bishop e3. So notice that white is not committing himself and for now he defends the pawn on d4 and getting ready to either castle queen side or perhaps play rook d1 or simply castle king side. In this case black has a very 
beautiful move e5. So the idea is to put pressure immediately on the center. And now if y takes on e5, d takes e, we have the intermediate move bishop takes knight. And now, of course, if bishop takes, knight takes e5, and black is doing well. And if white takes on f6, then bishop takes e2, hitting the queen, queen takes e2, and now queen takes f6. And again, we have exchanged a few pieces. White no longer has control of the center. Black has the outpost on d4. And really, this is about even game. If white doesn't take on e5, let's say white is trying to play the aggressive move. So after e5, so after e5, let's say white plays d5. Well, in this case, black has again intermediate move, bishop takes f3. And now if white takes on f3 with the bishop, knight d4 is a very strong move. Because if bishop takes d4, pawn takes d4, queen takes d4 is actually simply losing due to very strong knight takes e4 winning the game because if queen takes e4 rook e8 and the king is stuck in the middle so that's why white has to be extremely careful whenever black's knight is on d4 so that's why this is good for black but what if white actually after bishop takes f3, so the bishop is still in e3, doesn't take the bishop and rather takes the knight on c6. Well, in this case, we have a very strong move. This is a move that actually Ripka likes a lot and gives black advantage. b5, extremely strong idea. So white has nothing better than to take. And now after bishop takes g2, actually the knight is still on f6, after bishop takes g2, rook g1, bishop takes e4, and now white is in trouble. The king is stuck in the middle, black has collected a few pawns, g2 and e4, and it stands much, much better. So let's go back. So this is the position. Again, if white plays bishop e3, immediate e5, and black has no problems, and the key move now is to try to use that space advantage and to attack the knight on c6 with the move d5. So now black uses that misplaced queen on c4 with the move knight a5. And white has two options. White can play queen a4, which is the main move, or queen b4, which has been played also at the top level, but not as popular as the queen a4 move. If white plays queen b4, then we simply take on f3, and undermine the pawn center with the move c6. And now after castling, black solves all the opening problems with the move c takes d, pawn takes, and rook to c8. Notice that white has an isolated pawn on d5, and black can easily try to get one of his knights 
in front of the pawn. So either knight e8 followed by knight d8 is one plan. Another plan is we try to use the c4 square. So for example, if the pawn goes to b6, we're going to use the c4 square for our knight. Or, as a matter of fact, we can use it for the rook. And really, very easy piece plays, piece play for black. So thus, queen d4 is nothing to worry about. So let's go back. So this is the position, and we looked at the move queen to b4. So now let us look at the main move queen to a4, and black's plan is actually quite similar, pawn is still on c7, is to take on f3 and undermine the pawn center with the move c6. So bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, c6 castle and this is the topical position of the variation again the difference between the queen on a4 and b4 is very slight but this gives black an extra option of course we can try to take on d5 and play rook c8 although here it's not as good because having the queen on a4 there's always going to be a problem with the pawn on a7. So this is slightly better version for white. Instead, black has this very beautiful idea to counter punch that queen with the move b5. So queen has to go somewhere, either b4 or d1. Well, if queen goes to b4, we simply play a6. And now if white plays rook d1, then again, a very simple knight to d7. In both of these, we're not afraid of d takes c, because simply knight takes c6 gives black very good game. And again, queen is always running all over the place. And after knight d7, if white tries to play knight e2, with the idea to have a retreat for the queen, then black can counter strike with c5, queen e1, and after the following move, knight e5, black is better. As a matter of fact, this has happened in the game Elvis against Jennifer Shahari, and Jennifer got a very good game after knight f4, knight takes bishop, Ruining the king pawn structure, pawn takes. And here, after knight c4, now we have another piece into the game. b2 pawn is weak, knight is coming to e5. White's king is really weak. Black obtained an edge. So, after queen b4, we play a6. And so, let us go back and take a look at other options for white. So, white plays queen d1. This is another way to retreat with the queen. And now black actually plays very easy and simple move rook to c8. d takes c, and now b4. Attacking the knight. Notice that if knight moves somewhere, black is simply <clears throat> going to recapture on c6. And again, there, there are no problems whatsoever in black's position. So one game that at a very high level saw this position was Vallejo, at actually a very recent game against... Uh, Royce, who is a, also 
a Grunfeld expert, and Vallejo played this aggressive looking move e5. Well, it turns out that it only looks as aggressive, but in reality, all of this is simplifications to uh, tune about even position. And after mutual exchange, b takes c, e takes f, bishop takes f6, black actually obtained a very comfortable game, pawn takes c3, and now knight takes c6. So just only uh, take a look at this position once and you realize that black can only be better. He has a much better pawn structure. The pawn on c3 is weak and there is no real benefit for the two bishops that white has. It's only white who has to try to play for a draw. So this concludes the Russian variation or the Botvinnik variation with queen b3. So we looked at what happens after bishop takes f3. And if pawn takes f3, then we play the same way, very strong knight d4. This is a pawn sacrifice. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes d4. And black has very, very strong compensation with the move knight h5. And if queen retreats, let's say queen e3, then we capture dark squares with the move bishop e5. Now castle and king side is completely suicidal because queen h4 and there is no defense against me. So this is a real problem. And if white tries to play e5, then this also what gets white <clears throat> in trouble after the move rook e8, hitting the pawn. And if f4, then very strong move queen h4. And again, white is in serious problems here. Because if white tries to take the knight, black has this intermediate move, bishop takes e5. Notice that there is a pin, if pawn takes, queen is hanging. And if queen retreats, then bishop takes, knight will check, and complete disaster for white. So we looked at bishop e3 and now e5, and that's why the main line is d5. White is immediately taking advantage of the space advantage and attacking the knight on c6. But now black in turn attacks the queen, knight a5, and white has two options, to retreat to b4 or to a4. Um, in both options, black actually plays similarly. If queen b4, we take on f3. Bishop takes f3 and play c6. And if white castles, black can simply exchange on d5 and get the c file with rook c8. Notice that even though white has a bishop pair, White still has a problem with the pawn on d5. It's an isolated pawn. And black has a very easy plan. He can play knight e8, knight d6, which is a very strong square for the knight. In addition, he can utilize the c4 square for his rook, or later on if he plays b6 for the knight. So in this instance, black has very good play. Now, if white plays queen a4, so let us go back. So after knight a5, if white plays queen a4, then again, the plan is bishop takes knight, bishop takes f3, and the move c6. And now if white castles, we can still play c takes d 
and try to get the C file with rook C8, but this is a little bit different because in some lines pawn on A7 will be hanging if we move our knight. Instead, black has a much better way to counter this plan for, for white <coughs> to play move D5. As you see shortly, this aggressive approach on the queen side actually pays off if white plays queen d4, then we simply play a6 because we're not afraid pawn takes e6, knight takes e6. And if white plays rook to d1, then after knight d7, again, we're threatening to play c5. And one game, actually, white played knight e2, c5, queen e1. This is game between Jan Elvest and Jennifer Shahadi, and Jennifer actually obtained an advantage after the move knight e5. The bishop is not going anywhere, and after knight f4, knight takes, ruining the pawn structure, and now knight c4. So notice that white has several problems. Is The king is really weak, has weaknesses, f2 and f3, pawn on b2 is weak, and we have a very powerful dark square bishop. So we think, we actually believe, and uh, black has pretty solid advantage. Besides queen b4, white has another retreat with the queen, queen to d1. But here black again faces no problems whatsoever, with the move rook c8, he actually gets a very good game. For example, pawn takes pawn, and now we attack the knight with b4. Now anywhere the knight goes, we simply recapture the pawn and stand quite good. That's why white has to try to create uh, problems using some tactics. For example, the move e5. But this move e5 is actually nothing to be afraid of it's actually probably uh, more problematic for white than for black and this actually all happened in the game Vallejo against Royce black 2 on c3 pawn takes f6 and now Royce simply recaptured with the bishop on f6 so it turns out that after pawn takes c3 Black has no problems whatsoever after knight takes c6. He has, white has a problem with the pawn on c3. And even though he has a bishop pair, it plays no role in this position. So this concludes the Russian variation or the Botvinnik variation with the move queen to b3. Now, let's look at some games, typical games from the top players played with those variations, with the main variations of Grunfeld. <coughs> I have to point to you that uh, the advantages of playing Grunfeld and disadvantages are, disadvantages like you have to learn a lot, and white has all the choices. But advantages are that you get very dynamic play, which is very, very hard to get in any other opening. I think I would say um, the first Sicilian defense and Grunfeld are more filled with dynamic plays than any other openings in theory. <coughs> now let's look at some typical games, as I already mentioned, of some top players. Here is the game played practically a few months ago between Cheparinov and Kamsky. Game was won by White, but Black was absolutely winning and outplayed white in the end, even some top players make terrible errors 
in the time pressure and Kamsky lost this game. D4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5, c takes d, knight takes d5, e4, knight takes c3, b takes c3, bishop g7, bishop c4, c5, knight e2, knight c6, and bishop e3. Now this is one of the main variations and uh, we already analyzed it in a theoretical part of this uh, uh, DVD. So let's see what happened farther on in this game. Black castle, white castle. <coughs> Knight a5, bishop d3. Our goal is not to analyze this game in all details to the a very end. <coughs> what I want you to see is the type of position black got, dynamics, and how black, uh, got, uh, black got much, much better position. So, after bishop d3, b6, Queen d2, e5, that's what we already covered. And bishop h6 was played. Now, this, I don't know how good, this is a pawn sacrifice practically. And um, black, white is hoping for getting the king side attack. And as you can see in this game, they didn't get enough. c takes d, c takes d. And he takes d. <coughs> Bishop takes g7. King takes g7. And f4. That's the position white went for voluntarily. They tried to play e5 and f5 possibly on knight g3. And somehow organize the king side attack. F6, very precise move. Obviously, black is not interested in open position on king side. So, E5 will be met with F5. And F5 can be met with knight C6 with a potential knight E5. Rook A C1, <coughs> bishop G4. That's a good move. White tries to eliminate the knight, after which pawn on d4 becomes very strong. <coughs> and it's also knight is potential attacker on the king side. Knight g3. And now black has to retreat the bishop because f5 may lock the bishop out. Bishop will be in danger. Bishop d7 h4, rook c8, well, I don't see any, any real compensation in this position for a pawn, rook takes c8, bishop takes c8, h5, queen e7, queen e2, and bishop d7. <coughs> this position is uh, clearly better for black. There is absolutely no compensation for meaning before uh, missing uh, pawn. Rook c1, rook c8, rook e1. White is searching for something that is not there. And they have, well, they, they realize they already lost the thread of the game. Rook c3, e5, f5, obviously, h takes g, and h takes g. White has no point of entry. Black can improve their position. And black's king is absolutely safe. Queen d2. <coughs> Rook 
knight c4 was played, bishop takes c4, rook takes c4, queen d3, queen c5. Now black is simply threatening with rook c3, uh, followed by uh, d3 check. So after queen c5, e6 was played, bishop b5, and now black has many threats and is out of total desperation. White realized it, they're totally outplayed. They played knight h5 check. And correct move king h6 because gh, queen g3 check with queen's penetration gives uh, a white some chances. King h6, this is a winning move and that was what, what was played. Queen h3, d3, king h2. G takes H and Queen H4. White was desperate. They sacrificed peace and now they are hoping for <coughs> some kind of a perpetual or some kind of instant attack. Bishop E8, that's correct move. Rook E5. Queen F8 was played. That was also good. Queen g5 check. King h7. Rook takes f5. Queen g7. Queen d8. And this is the critical position on this diagram. And this position is totally winning for black. Black made first error here by playing rook c2. A rook c2 simply allows rook g5. The correct move was d2. This is a winning continuation <clears throat> because on rook takes g5, on, on rook g5, uh, black simply goes, well, after d2, rook g5 has to play it, queen f8, and after rook takes h5, simply bishop takes h5, queen takes f8, e7, I mean d1, queen, and there is no, absolutely no perpetual, on queen e7, king g8, and on uh, I don't know what what uh, for what's to try here. Uh, queen e7, king g8, queen g5, king f8, and uh, checks fade very quickly. Actually, there is a queen on d1 because on queen f6, simply king e8, and there is no f7 square. And if uh, uh, white plays e7, king e8, this position should be easily winning with extra piece for uh, black. What happened in the, in the position uh, in the game, time, <clears throat> uh, Kamsky was very short on time and he made absolutely critical error in uh, this position. In this position with a pawn on d2, pawn on d3, and rook on c4. So in the in this position, after queen d8, um, he played rook c2, threatening mate on g2. But white was gonna play rook g5 anyway. So that happened to be total waste of time. And he even here after bishop g6. Black is doing okay, but what happened is queen c7 was played. And after queen takes d3, there's a pawn, a white pawn on e6, 
<coughs> in this position, even bishop g6 is fine, but queen c7 is totally losing move, queen takes d3, and after king h8, queen f5, uh, black is uh, totally helpless, and black resigned. But did you see that <coughs> what we needed to know, that in the middle game, white sacrificed to pawn and got practically nothing. They got very trivial compensation for it. Black was doing okay. <coughs> you know, now I I don't play Grunfeld myself, but I do play d4 a lot, and so I did all my life. I had a couple of lines with the Grunfeld I played, and now with modern development, I don't know what would I do for white. I don't know if there is any way I can hope for any advantage in Grunfeld. And uh, even though there is a learn to lot for black, I think it's good to learn for two different reasons. And the reasons are, uh, first of all, you uh, learn a lot about strategy and learn a lot about dynamics and you learn a lot about chess. Here is another game between very well-known grandmaster uh, Van Welly that played white against even better known um, Alexei Shirov. That was with the latest analysis and latest innovations for uh, white in Grunfeld. Let's see the game. D4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5, cd, knight takes d5, <coughs> e4, knight takes c3, b takes c, bishop g7, bishop c4, c5, knight e2, knight c6, bishop e3, both sides castle, knight a5, bishop d3, and b6, rook c1, <coughs> e5. Okay, in this position we saw um, Ceparino played queen d2 and bishop h6 and it didn't turn out too good for white in the opening. So, Shirov played rook c1, uh, Van Wely played rook c1, e5, d takes c and bishop e6. It's just the way we cover on theoretical part, how to play these variations. This is pawn sacrifice that gives a black good game. c4, b takes c, bishop takes c5, bishop h6. And this move we also covered in uh, uh, the chapter of analyzing variation. So rook c3, <coughs> Rook e8, <coughs> bishop a3. Now, when I put this position on uh, a Ripka engine, <coughs> uh, a Ripka program with a very powerful engine, Ripka, one of the, you know, I shouldn't say one of the few, probably the only program that would evaluate this position correctly. And Ripka says, position is almost equal. Uh, black has full compensation. Queen c7. Now, the reason when we say compensation, <coughs> well, is this just words or let's just point verbally. I want to tell you what is this compensation word 
based on. It's based on weak pawn on c4, bad bishop on d3, very bad knight on e2, bad I mean they don't have any mobility, and bishop on a3, it's kind of shooting blanks, and if those bishops exchanged, black is potentially very powerful square on c5, as well as the weak d4 c5 squares. So position <coughs> should be evaluated as equal. Queen c2 was in the game, rook a b8, c5. Now, <coughs> obviously, white doesn't want to play with the bishop on d3 for too long, and they are anxious to uh, free this bishop and activate the c pawn, which will justify standing of rook on c3 and queen on c2. So c5 is very natural move. Rook e d8. All black's pieces are absolutely great, uh, placed greatly, and go very good positions. After um, uh, rook d8. Now, what can, what should white do? Should they advance the c pawn? Black wants to play knight c6 and knight d4. Well, they did advance the pawn, and now black cannot put knight on c6, but after rook b6, c6 pawn cannot be defended anymore. And uh, rook b6 was played, rook b1, <coughs> white is looking for equality now. Rook takes c6, rook takes c6, <coughs> knight takes c6. Now white wants to put rook on c1, which is impossible with the bishop on h6. So white played bishop c1. Now black exchanges bishop, rook takes c1. Black goes queen d6. Very powerful move, and white is in serious trouble. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> here, queen takes c6 was played by Van Welly. I want to tell you what happened in a game. What happened in the game, queens were exchanged, and rook took on d3, threatening mate, and black has very, white has very difficult position in the end game, and they lost. We don't want to go through all the game, but I want to tell you this, that after queen takes c6, uh, black saw that end end game with big advantage and immediately went. But after queen takes d3, white is about to resign. It's totally hopeless because the knight is hanging, the checkmate is threatening, and if white goes queen knight g3, which is the only possible uh, way to stop. Uh, black from checkmating them, then rook c8 simply wins the game. This simple two-move combination was missed by both grandmasters, and that happens sometimes when they spend a lot of time, a lot of energy. That happens. So, uh, I have to point here, if rook e1, then queen takes e2, uh, white is completely lost. So, if instead of exchanging queens, black took on d3 right away, white could have resigned right now. But as I mentioned already, queens were exchanged, rook took on d3, f4, bishop g4 was played, and after knight c3, ef, Black got an uh, uh, extra pawn, and they went on winning the game. We don't need to look at all of it, you know. 
all the game because it it doesn't serve the purpose of showing the middle game position of this variation of a Grunfeld. And the last game I want to show you, actually, that's kind of very, very interesting. And this is very instructive game too. You see how um, uh, right after the opening we got position that I know very well because I played uh, Nimzo Averbach variation and you will see how from Grunfeld you got almost the same type of position that you get in Nimzovich where there are seven pawns on board. Position is completely locked and it's um, absolutely static and white has no play and no hope. That's what the game was. Actually very valuable, instructive game. Oh, again, also with uh, Van Welly as white and Gatakamski for black. And I know I was working with Gatakamski and I know that uh, uh, he uh, is good at this type of position. So here is the game. d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5, <clears throat> cd, knight takes d5, e4, knight takes c3, bc, bishop g7, bishop c4, c5, knight e2, just the way we played already several times, knight c6, bishop e3, castle, castle, knight a5, bishop d3, and b6. Queen d2 was played, the other option is rook c1, e5, d5, and f5. Bishop g5, queen e8, f3, and black here completely closes the center, the pawn structure. Black went c4, bishop c2, and f4. <coughs> now, this position is very interesting and I have to point that this position is much favorable for black. I know because I have played those positions many many times this type of positions. I've never played Grunfeld but I can get it through different openings and I have to tell you this. Uh, looks like white has protected pass pawn they have no weaknesses, but why black is so much better? Black is so much better because white has no play at all and absolutely sealed queen side. In the center, white does not have any squares, access squares, no d4, e3, and black can put some piece on d6, queen, knight, or maybe bishop eventually, and totally stop d pawn. And on a king side, white has, black has very good potential of advancing because of a pawn structure e5 and f4 gives them a lot of space edge. So, this position is already not good for white. And you will see what developed. It developed just accordingly to my evaluation. And that's exactly what happened. King h1, h6. 
is not much to analyze. Actually, for next 20 or 30 moves, pieces were going back and forth, back and forth, and Black achieved uh, what they wanted, what was their goal, uh, superiority on king side, while uh, White did nothing. And White did nothing because they could do nothing in this position. h6, bishop h4, g5, bishop e1, bishop d7, g3, queen h5, knight g1, rook f7, queen g2, king h8, bishop d1. This is all prophylactic for white, but black is not about to open the position. Rook g8, rook b1, bishop f8, bishop e2, bishop c5, and on bishop f2, bishop d6. Now, you don't exchange dark square bishops for two reasons. First of all, the more pieces are on the board, the more difficult for white to play because you see their king side is absolutely clogged. And also, according to the plan, put some piece on d6. Well, that some piece to block the pawn is a bishop. So after bishop d6, rook b2, rook f6, Next maneuvering and preparation for final action can be conducted several different ways. Queen e8, knight h3, and now rook f2, g6, knight f2, h5, g4, rook h6. G H Rook takes H five and Knight G four. Black White achieved temporary blockade, but King G seven, Bishop D one, Rook G H eight. You see every one of Black's pieces aiming on King side except for Knight on A five, which controls absolutely controls the queen side, sealing and stops white from any kind of counterplay. In case of need, <coughs> black didn't need it in this game, this knight can come into play as well. So white is absolutely, absolutely lost here. And now rook f2, f2, rook h3, Queen f1, bishop takes g4, f takes g, and queen g6, attacking the e4 pawn. Bishop f3, bishop c5. Uh, this position, in, is no need to say, it's uh, absolutely hopeless. And uh, white could have resigned uh, right now. Rook f to e2, knight b7, queen g2, knight d6. That's another knight. It's another piece potentially attacking e4 pawn. a4, queen h7, queen f1, king f6. Queen g2. That's like a cat and mouse game. Well, like cat already black captured the totally paralyzed white position and now playing with it. So after queen g2, queen to d7, you see what black does is repositions queen and uh, rook and I will show you why. Uh, rook a2, rook h6, queen f1, queen h7, queen g2, 
<clears throat> and finally, position is absolutely ripe for uh, a conclusive shot. And rook takes f3, queen takes f3, rook h3, queen g2, and now f3 should end the game, but just to stop queen f1 or maybe rook f2, black plays king e7, <clears throat> and there is no defense against f3 on some kind of rook f2. We don't even have to take this rook. We can take on e4, and uh, in this position after king e7, white simply resides. I think it's a great <coughs> static game and a typical for Grunfeld, typical for closed positions that may occur in this variation of Grunfeld. So, in conclusion, <coughs> I want to say that this main variation with knight takes, uh, with c takes d and e4 for white, they are very playable for black now that found new ways uh, of getting counterplay. And uh, I personally, it's a matter of taste, I'm not trying to say that black has an advantage, but I wouldn't be happy playing those positions for white. Thank you very much, and enjoy playing Grunfeld.